OK, so good morning. Um, so we're continuing from where we left off. The last thing we did was define invariants. So these invariants, we're assuming we're in 3D. And um, so they're defined in terms of three arbitrarily chosen linearly independent vectors. Okay, and because they're linearly independent, the triple product is non-zero. And so I can divide these quantities by uh, that the, the triple product. And uh, you notice the difference between the three invariants. So you have combinations of two appearances of A, single appearance of A, and where A appears uh, on every vector within the triple product. And so you have these three invariants, three possibilities. And they're called invariants because irrespective of how you choose A, B, C, the final number that comes out, eventually A has components with respect to any basis you choose. With respect to different bases, the way the components look in a matrix will look different. But when you calculate these numbers, these numbers will be precisely the same. Okay, and that's why they're called invariants. And uh, the first and the third one will appear quite a lot. The first one is called uh, the trace. The last one is the determinant. And the second one is uh, another um, expression with no name. OK, now I'm going to try not to forget uh, and keep this thing on the board and hopefully make use of it um, 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 again, this lecture. Uh, but while we have this, while we have these definitions, let me go ahead and uh, define a, another operator. And this is the inner dot or scalar product of two tensors. And just like for a vector, my notation is such that I'm going to denote it with a dot b. And the meaning will be trace A, B, transpose, OK? So this is a new definition for us. And this is, as you notice, it's an intrinsic definition because I'm not explicitly referring to any basis here. Okay? It's in terms of, a, of something that is essentially related to invariance, OK? Um, now, of course, you may want to go ahead and derive the uh, the extrinsic form of that. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have A, B transpose appearing in the trace. This is a tensor C. And I told you last time that, in fact, is something you will show. In this case, so if I had A, B, C, I, J would be A, I, K, B, K, J. That would be a standard matrix tensor, tensor product. But in this case, I have transpose. It's on the right-hand side. So what's going to happen is that the free index will appear on the right-hand side. OK? So, so the free index appears on the side of the um, transpose. OK? So then, um, we can apply the definition of trace. So it's some of the diagonal components. It's going to be CII. In other words, you go and look. You find the different indices. You make them equal. In this case, it's going to be IK, IK. OK. So that is how. Um, A dot B looks like. So it's essentially equivalent to, right? You take the matrix appearances of these two tensors, and term by term, you take the corresponding terms, multiply them, and add them up. Okay. Um, now, as we did for, as soon as I defined the transpose, remember, I said, well, um, uh, we, we can have a matrix equal to its transpose or tensor, sorry, then it's symmetric, and I define skew symmetry. And then I said, well, in terms of these definitions, we can always define the symmetric and the skew symmetric parts of a tensor. So now that I have uh, the trace operator, I can also define uh, in a similar, a longest similar idea, um, the so called spherical and deviatoric. Uh, parts of a tensor, but first I need to define what a spherical or a deviatoric tensor is. So let me do that. So a tensor is deviatoric or spherical 
if, for instance, if it is spherical, right? So this is type of, uh, um, no, let me say, um, it's con construction I'm going to, going to use. So you follow the upper row and or you follow the lower row. Individually, they are two independent sentences. So if it is spherical, then it must be of the form a scalar times the identity. And it is deviatoric if it has zero trace. Okay? These are just definitions. Spherical tensor, identity times a scalar. It is deviatoric if the trace is equal to zero. Obviously, you cannot have both of them at the same time unless alpha is equal to uh, zero. So now you can go ahead and define the spherical or the deviatoric part of a tensor. And the spherical part is going to be um, the trace divided by one third. So let's write it like this. Divided by three, sorry. So one, th one over three trace A identity is the spherical part of a tensor. And the deviatoric part is simply the tensor itself minus the spherical part. And just, just look for a second. So you notice the, uh, let me say, the purpose of the definition. So you look at the deviatoric part. It has to be something that is traceless. So the trace of this has to be equal to zero. Trace of this is equal to the trace of this minus the trace of that. OK? Right? Because trace is just um, by the definition of the operators, right? So, um, so now. Um, so it's trace A minus trace of that, which means that trace of A spherical must be equal to trace of A. So when I define A spherical, it has to do with the trace of A. It's the traces of both have to be equal. So I go back. I know that it's a factor times identity. So that factor, the factor has to do with the trace of A necessarily by the second definition. And so the trace of this is three times whatever it appears here, right? For instance, the trace of that is three alpha, okay? And hence, you have the factor of one over three appearing, okay? So A spherical could actually be anything, but so that e devio, A deviatoric is defined, can be defined as such, A spherical is one over three times the trace of the tensor. And as you notice, in fact, from the second definition, again, just like for the sum of the symmetric and skew parts equaling to the tensor itself. Here, the sum of the deviatoric and the spherical parts is, again, equal to the tensor. So these are just some convenient note, um, definitions that we're going to employ. Okay. So go ahead and write that if you, if you haven't completed it yet. Um, so now let me go ahead and uh, move on to right, uh, the next meaningful definition in line, which is inverse and cofactor. Okay, so now that we have determinant, yes? That's a good question. Yes, so if you had a, right, I'm assuming presently that it's three by three, right? I started from the invariance, but if you want to define the spherical part in two, yes, you would put a factor of two, one over two. Yeah, good question. Um, all right, so I want to move on to inverse and cofactor, and since that question just popped up, let us assume that we are in 3D. So in matrix form, the components form a 3 by 3 uh, matrix. 
okay? Um, so now A inverse, as we know, is something that, it's, it's an object, it's a new operator, and it's defined such that A inverse A, and now we know what it means to have two tensors multiplying each other, right? Really, there should be a vector here, but I've done away with that. I know how to work out the components of that product. So A, A inverse should be equal to identity. So that's the definition of A inverse, either from the left or the right, it gives you the same answer. And now what I can do is just like for transpose, put that into component form. Um, so when I write A inverse IK, I'm referring to the IK component of the tensor A inverse, if you like called A inverse B. So this is component IK of B, which is A inverse, right? So it's not like one over AIK, okay? Be careful, this is not one over AIK. Um, so the notation, the context will always, should always make it clear. So that is the left-hand side, right? I have A inverse A, so two tensors, essentially matrix component form multiplying each other. The result should of course be equal to delta IJ because that's the expression for identity, or I can have the inverse appearing on the right-hand side, it doesn't matter either way, the answer is delta ij. And in our setting, uh, without any complications, so uh, we know that A inverse will exist if and only if determinant of A is equal to uh, zero. Okay, so that's the condition that I'm going to eventually Keep in mind, okay? So if I want to calculate the determinant, I'm sorry, the inverse, I need to check that determinant is non-zero. And that's going to come up very soon when we talk about eigenvalues. Um, all right, so now I'm going to go ahead and once we know the inverse, right, and uh, it's very easy to calculate it in practice, right? So, well, okay, we're going to come to that. Well, let's look at the cofactor first. Let's define the cofactor of a tensor. And I'm going to use the notation A, so the sharp sign from music, if you like. Okay? A cofactor. Now, this is a very convenient definition. At this stage, perhaps let me remind you a number of identities uh, uh, that you worked with in um, the homework, in homework number one. Uh, so, for instance, if you have a tensor operating on a vector bond another vector. Now that is the way the operation order looks. So first do that and then take the bond, right? Now for practical purposes, often it turns out that I'd like to take this tensor outside. And in homework number one, you've shown that you can do so without any complications like this. So in other words, first you can bond the two vectors and then you can put the A on the left hand side. The trick is that if A was operating on B, then it comes out to the right-hand side as a transpose, which is also a homework problem. Now, uh, so this is, in, 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 in some sense, A cofactor has a similar purpose. Again, we're in 3D, but this time, instead of a bun, I have a simple uh, cross product, and A appears twice. And since A appears twice, I ask myself, well, is it possible that somehow a can be taken outside, with outside of this operation. It turns out the answer is yes, and that defines intrinsically the cofactor of a tensor. Now beware, there are different names always for these things. Things like cofactor, adjugate, adjoint, etc. float around. This is my choice that is also a common choice. Okay? So that is the definition of a um, cofactor. Okay, so we're going to make use of this as well. That's the intrinsic definition. Okay, in fact, uh, you can easily work out the uh, extrinsic definition um, yourselves soon. So now I want to define the inverse, and I'm going to do that in terms of the cofactor. And so it turns out that A inverse exists when it exists, right? the cofactor tensor is equal to determinant of the tensor A inverse 
transpose. Okay. So that is a compact definition of what the cofactor is. And the inverse is now expressed indirectly in terms of the cofactor. And has to be, of course, invertible because I have the determinant appearing there. OK. Um, now, just a word. Sometimes I will combine multiple notations, multiple um, operations like this when there is no ambiguity. So this is equal to A inverse transpose or the order doesn't matter. It's A transpose inverse. So I just combine them and write minus t to indicate that. Uh, so now that we have this expression, I can actually, as soon as I know what the cofactor is, I can calculate A inverse. So this allows me, this, this expression allows me to calculate inverse itself. Okay. All right. And this. Um, tensor there is for us will be the adjugate. Okay? So the adjugate is simply the transpose of the cofactor. Now let me remind you how to just calculate the inverse because you might need it, you might have forgot, maybe it's been a long time. All these years you've been doing it with a code, you didn't do it yourself, we just quickly, quickly do it. Okay? And it's going to be based in terms of the cofactor. So essentially, right, the idea is in the definition itself, A inverse, okay, it's defined, but well, how do I calculate it? You first calculate the cofactor, it has explicit, very, very neat uh, expression and definition, and then A inverse comes from that. So the first step is the cofactor. And um, that will be our cofactor matrix. And let us do take a matrix. I'm going to directly go for, um, well, all right. Well, let's, let's first do a 2D one. One, two, three, four. Although I do want to actually restrict myself to 3D so that I can calculate the three invariants as well. So for 2D, you can also do the trace. You can also do the determinant. But um, we live in 3D. So eventually, I want to work on this matrix. OK. Well, the right. So eventually, once one works out what a cofactor means, it's equivalent to doing the following. As you will remember, you go ahead and start with putting pluses and minuses on these numbers, right? And then you calculate the determinants of the minors. The minor for a 2D one would be, for instance, I look at that. I need to right, cross over this and that. And that's the minor. Multiply it with the sign. So that would be a 4. So for that one, it would be 3. Multiply it with the sign minus 3. Uh, for this one, it would be 2. Multiply it with the sign minus 2 and 1. Okay. So for that one, right, let's do that again, right? Uh, let's do this one first. Okay, well, this is a, well, yeah, let's do it anyway. So the minor of zero, right? So determinant of them. So that's going to be determinant of the minor 3, 15, minus 9. So it's uh, 15, but there is the minus sign as well, right? So I'm going to write minus 15, right? Uh, and in this fashion, you fill the whole thing, right? So just, you can practice yourselves for a second if you like, but I'm going to write down the numbers directly. Now you can check yourselves. <laughs> 
Okay, so that is the cofactor matrix. Okay, so now let me go ahead and calculate the invariance. Now, as I do that, um, ju just maybe give me a second here, uh, and then you can continue. So let me write down an identity that, that holds in uh, 3D. Okay, so in 3D, it turns out that the second invariant is the trace of a cofactor. This is something you can show independently. That would be a nice small exercise. Okay. So that gives me a simple way of calculating the uh, second. Because if I need to calculate the inverse, for instance, if I do, then a cofactor comes uh, into play anyway. Um, so then I can immediately extract the second invariant. Of course, you can always go ahead and use the original definition as well. Very cool. All right, so now if I wanted to calculate the three invariants of this tensor. So the first one would be sum of the diagonal ones. It's an 8. Okay. The second one, it's a little bit lengthy in the original definition, but here is the trace of the cofactor. So I just sum these up, and the answer is 2. Sorry, it's minus 1. And the third one, right? remember, so the operation is such that uh, what you do is you choose a row or a column, and then you multiply the components of the uh, cofactor matrix with the corresponding components of the row or the column. So let's look at the rows, for instance, right? So what I was supposed to do was look at that row, calculate the cofactor matrix, and then multiply this with that, that with that, and that with that, and sum them up. That would be, in practice, your determinant. So it would be minus 8, 24, so that would be a 16. Now the thing is, right? does it matter which one you choose? No. So for instance, I could have chosen that one. So 0, 2, 3, 6, 10, again 16. And if you look at this one, again, of course, it should be 16. It doesn't matter which one you choose. So these are then the three invariants of your uh, tensor. So then I move on to the next meaningful thing, right, step by step, uh, to a eigenvalue problem. Um, so in an eigenvalue problem, we seek um, vectors, and let's denote them with V at the stage, for a tensor A such that the tensor A operating on this special vector turns out to give you a scalar multiple of the vector. Okay? And I am looking for values, I'm looking for vectors V and corresponding lambda in a non-trivial setting. In other words, non-trivial means V is not equal to zero, because if it is, then uh, it holds for any lambda, right? So that would be our eigenvector. And that would be eigenvalue. So for non-trivial solutions, and that really paves the way for us to proceed with the analysis of the problem, right? So if I want the answer to be non-trivial, then a, putting the right-hand side to the left-hand side, AV minus lambda V. But lambda V is lambda identity V, right? And I can keep identity here, okay? So now I took V uh, outside, and that has to be equal to zero. And I know that V is non-zero, 
And the only way that's possible is, well, if this thing here is invertible, then V is necessarily zero, right? But I'm looking for non-trivial solutions, and the only possibility is that this actually is not invertible, and that is going to be my condition. Okay, for a non-trivial solution. Okay, now that's what I'm, I'm going to show independently on the next board. But now if you go ahead and take this tensor and calculate its determinant, the determinant comes out to be equal to, um, or apart from a, uh, so let me see. Right, possibly apart from a constant, but No, well, that's fine. Yeah, that's exactly our determinant. And the determinant of that tensor comes out to be the left-hand side. And now the determinant has to be equal to 0. And this is what you know and remember as the characteristic equation. OK, so in the characteristic equation, there appears, perhaps you have never, you may have never seen the characteristic equation directly in this form where you know that it's, in term, it's cubic in terms of the eigenvalues, but now I have the three invariants appearing explicitly, perhaps that you have not seen before. All right, so now that's the result, and eventually that is what we would um, like to solve. So now, one thing that we should immediately recognize is that this is a cubic equation. A cubic equation will, depending on the values of everything, it will, for instance, in this case, I can let lambda become a very small, very large negative number. And so it will, the whole thing, the left-hand side will start from a negative value. And if it, lambda is very, very large and positive, it will go to a very large positive value, which means this thing has to cross zero at some point. And indeed, a cubic equation, a cubic polynomial, has at least one real root. It has to cross the real axis. The, z, um, um, the zero axis at some point. So has at least one real root. Might be positive, might be negative. And the remaining roots might be complex, not necessarily uh, real, okay? But it has at least one um, real root. And that root, of course, could also be zero. Okay? Zero is possible. Zero is an eigenvalue. But zero is not an eigenvector. Okay, that would be a trivial one. Yeah. Okay, why do you say the determinant is equal to zero, not the whole matrix is zero? No, no, no. The, the, the matrix itself is not going to be equal to zero. Just the determinant is equal to zero. But why? Like, would you have a zero matrix? Or a matrix that's equal to zero. Equal to zero? Uh, that would also be right, but that would be a special case, right? So, for instance, if I had a spherical tensor, then the non-identity factor that multiplies the identity. So this tensor has three eigenvalues, all equal to alpha. Okay? And therefore, as you say, this is equal to 0. But in general, that doesn't need to be the case, because not all tensors are in a spherical form. This is a spherical form. right? Um, so what we impose is simply that, right, as you say, if this is 0, this identically holds, but that would be a special case. What I only want is that since this is not supposed to be 0 because I'm looking for non-trivial solutions, I shouldn't be able to invert this. And that is where my 0 determinant condition comes. Okay. All right. So um, now, um, having written this, I'd like to write one more thing, which is quite nice, and we might eventually make use of it. Um, 
There is a so-called Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Again, some things I will not show either in the homework. Well, I will not show in class, and you will not show it homework. But if you're interested, I can always uh, refer you to details, or uh, you can look for a proof yourself. Uh, there is a so-called Cayley-Hamilton theorem, which says that any tensor I'm going to call star the characteristic equation. A tensor satisfies its own characteristic equation. Okay? Now, that statement has to be interpreted carefully. So in this case, it means the following. What you're going to do is, is instead of lambda, you're going to put in the tensor itself. That's what it means. Because lambda is our variable. I'm replacing it with the tensor. Okay? So it's going to read a cube minus identity of a, a squared, plus second invariant of a, a, minus the third invariant. Of course, it has to be in tensor form, so I'm going to throw in here an identity. So that is the so-called Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Again, if you're interested, I can lead you to details. Now, the nice thing about the Cayley-Hamilton theorem is it will allow you to um, extract expressions that are non-standard. So for instance, what I can do is, look here for a second, right? I'm not going to write down everything. So what I can do is I can multiply this equation on the left with a inverse. a inverse 0 is still 0. Um, so a inverse, that, that's going to be a squared, a identity, a inverse. And then since the right-hand side is 0, I can put this to the right-hand side. It would be determinant A, A inverse. Divide everything by the determinant and obtain an expression for A inverse. So if you do that exercise, what you're going to obtain is A inverse is equal to 1 over determinant of A. Um, and then A squared minus first invariant A plus second invariant identity. Okay. No? So, so that looks strange, okay? uh, but on the other hand, remember that I also have a definition for A inverse. Okay? And that definition is something that I just erased. It was on one of these boards, but it was defined as 1 over determinant and A adjugate, which is cofactor transpose. So that whole thing on the, on the side, additional knowledge, must be the transpose of the cofactor or the adjugate made tensor. Okay. All right, so uh, there will come a time when we will need, at least in the homework, when you will need the Cayley-Hamilton theorem as well. OK, so now what I'd like to show is where the characteristic equation comes from. It's a very neat uh, derivation based on the expression of the three invariants. So let's do that together. So the, in the definition of the invariance, there appears the triple product of three randomly chosen vectors. And that's why I hesitated just for a second whether this thing was exactly equal to the determinant or a multiple of that triple product. But you're going to see the answer yourself anyway now. Let's do the derivation. OK, so I'm going to enforce 0 equals determinant of a minus lambda i. Notice that as of now, I don't know what lambda is. That's exactly the purpose of the characteristic equation. And so this is what I'm going to define to be the A tensor B. Um, and I invoke the definition of, so now that I've written this, I can move up the board for the definition of the invariance. And we're going to make use of those. And I start with the determinant. So the determinant is, I choose arbitrary three linearly independent vectors. Again, let's call them A, B, C. 
That's the determinant. And of course, I have an expression for what B is. So it's A minus lambda i. So, so far I've done nothing but write down the definition of the determinant and explicitly express the tensor I'm taking the determinant of. Okay. Okay, so if you've written that much, please pause now. Do not write any longer. Let's do this exercise together. I'm going to have to do several multiplications. I might mess up on the way, so you're going to help me. I'm going to work with this term here, the upper term. I'm going to multiply step by step everything together, right? So uh, let us start with, right? Um, so for instance, the A terms, right? So I'm going to expand that, right? So I have A. A. So let me know if I make a mistake, right? I'm taking the A's first. That's the simplest one. AC, right? That will be one term. Uh, then I can have two appearances of A, so plus, right? I can have AA, and then minus lambda IB, which is minus lambda B, and then AC plus minus lambda a, a, b, a, c, plus a, 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 b, minus lambda c. Okay, that would be, those would be three terms where a appears twice, right? Um, and what else? I can have A appearing only once, right? So that would be um, A, A minus lambda B minus lambda C plus minus lambda A, A, B minus lambda C. Right? So. If A appears three times, there is no lambda. If A appears twice, there is one lambda. If A appears, if it appears only once, there are two lambdas, etc. So eventually the last term will be no A, all lambdas, right? So that's sort of I'm I'm checking my calculations based on that stencil, if you like. So and the last one is minus lambda A, minus lambda B, and then A C. Right? I hope I haven't mixed, missed, missed anything. And the last one is A lambdas alone. Minus lambda A minus lambda b minus lambda c. I missed something. Oh. No, yeah? I was just going to ask, how did we expand this directly? Because previously we said that the, uh, the expansion of the triple product was like a bank, b bank, q. A, a it's bank. first dot. Yeah, but, 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 but I'm just multiplying. I'm not doing anything fancy. So I'm picking. So this is. Uh, I'm just asking how, how did we wrote in this? How did we wrote this in directly you know, summation form? Is it something like that? Um, right. Um, well, let's do that. That's a fair question. So, well, let's keep the invariants here, and uh, let's write that here. So I take, doesn't matter, any term, um, I guess I can take A 
So what I'm using, one thing I'm using, obviously it's equal to, this is equal to A, A, B, C, minus B, A, B, C. Okay? And another thing I'm using is A, and I'll, I'll choose either one, I'll choose B. So here, A and B have lost their meanings compared to what I was just writing. These are any two tensors presently. His question is, how come when I see this, I can split this apart like this and do it additively? And likewise here, how do I say that this is equal to A, A, B, C minus A, B, B, C? And for that, we only need to refer to the definition of the triple product. So, so if you go ahead and, so if you had this, right, instead of B, okay, one more step in between, I can simplify this a little bit. Um, so this is B prime, this is Let's call that B1, and let's call that B2. This is also, in that form, A minus BB, it is also B1 minus B2. Right? Okay. So the question is, why does this hold? Okay. Therefore, now I can forget about the tensors themselves and really ask myself the following question. Why does... For instance, I'm just looking at the second one. For the th first one, you can do a similar exercise. B1, C, minus A, B2, C. Okay? That's what I would have to show. And now I can use the definition of the triple product if you're not convinced. Either you just take the definition and you just realize that B1 minus B2 substituted in, in here would split into two parts naturally, or you would go ahead and calculate if you are not convinced component-wise. Okay? Let's do that together after lecture component-wise. Okay? Right. But for now, let us believe that this is, that's a fair question, good question. Why does that hold? Okay? And uh, we can answer it independently as a nice exercise afterwards. Okay? So presently, however, I have used that. Okay? Nice. Uh, so now that's the result. Remember that that's only the upper part. Everything is eventually divided by the triple product. So I have to divide by the triple product all of these, A, B, C, and then A, B, C, A, B, C, and finally, A, B, C, okay? And now, I look at the other board, okay? Where I have the definitions of all the invariants, okay? And so, this one, minus lambda, minus lambda cube, right? Because lambda just comes outside, and ABC divided by AD, ABC, that's gone. Uh, this one is minus lambda, minus lambda, they just come outside, lambda squared multiplying a single appearance of A, combinations of single appearances, and that is nothing but the trace, the first invariant. So this one here, in fact, let me write it slightly differently so it's more compact. Let's do it like this. Uh, so this is minus lambda cubed, and that one is lambda squared, the first invariant, minus lambda two combinations of two appearances, that is the second invariant, and the third invariant. You sum them up, you get 
your characteristic equation apart from the minus sign. Okay, so therefore this is minus the determinant, the left-hand side, not the determinant. Okay, questions on that uh, compact derivation? Oh, here? Okay, so as I said, this is just, this is an independent verification. It's not immediate that this should hold. That's why I'm saying that if you're interested, you should try to prove it and I'll be happy to help you, okay? So all I'm saying is that that is the statement of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. I just stated it, I didn't prove it, okay? The Cayley-Hamilton theorem says that any tensor satisfies its own characteristic equation. And that satisfies comes in quotes because it's a interpretation the way it's stated. You have to replace the eigenvalue with the tensor itself. And why should it hold? It's not trivial, of course. You have to work it out, right? Okay. If you're interested, I can help you. Okay. I just wrote it down because at, at, at some stage we will need it. So, so it's not, it's, it has to do with the eigenvalue problem, the expression, but it is independent from the direct uh, uh, expression of the eigenvalue problem itself, right? Further questions? Right, as I said, the math part serves two purposes. One, we recall things, uh, but uh, in some sense, a major purpose is, of course, you have encountered all of this in one form or another before. We really put everything in tensor notation, so it gives us a nice way of experimenting and uh, warming up to tensor notation, because that's all we are going to use as soon as this mathematical preliminary section ends. So if you have any difficulty following any transition or have, have, have let me say, you're unclear about any expression, just let me know. Okay. It is important. It's very important that you feel comfortable with the tensor expressions uh, when we're done, probably next week with this section. All right. So since there are no questions, let me move on. Now we're looking at eigenvalue problems and I'm interested in uh, always, uh, let me say, eventually um, tensors that have um, real uh, components with respect to my choices. And in particular, let us look at um, tensors that are symmetric. Now, in all of the eigenvalue related expressions that I'm going to write, I am going to assume that the tensor is symmetric, okay? From this point on until we move on to the next subtopic, okay? So if A is symmetric, then there are some nice properties. One, okay? The eigenvalues don't have to be, as I said, the roots of the characteristic equation, right? There is at least one real root, but the remaining two, they can be uh, complex, right? Uh, but if A is symmetric, it turns out that all the eigenvalues are real, right? Um, now, and the eigenvectors are also real. So if I express with respect to some bases, the components will look real. Now, moreover, that's not the only thing that we obtain from symmetric uh, tensors. For a symmetric tensor, if you pick two eigenvalues that are not equal to one another, then it turns out that their eigenvectors are orthogonal. Okay. So. In words, it means that eigenvectors belonging to distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal to one another. Okay, I repeat that. Eigenvectors 
belonging to distinct eigenvalues, non-equal ones, are orthogonal. Um, so that is a nice uh, expression. So now let me assume that all the eigenvalues are different. In practice, it might turn out that uh, two eigenvalues are the same. And in that case, well, what do I do? It turns out that even if two eigenvalues are the same, you can associate them with two eigenvectors that are still orthogonal. Okay? You can do it. So just, just to avoid that complication, tiny complication, I'm going to assume all the eigenvalues presently, just for a second, that they are different. Now, if they are different, they are all dif distinct. And therefore, all the eigenvectors are orthogonal to one another. And immediately, that makes them linearly independent. Right? And hence, I can use them as a basis. Okay? And that's the idea. So um, the eigenvector, eigenvectors of a symmetric tensor immediately form a basis for our space. Okay? Um, so therefore, if I take the lambdas to be as such, okay, the three eigenvalues, and sometimes that's called the spectrum of the tensor A, based on all of that discussion, it turns out that you can express a symmetric tensor in terms of its corresponding eigenvector basis as such. Very simple expression. Okay? This is any symmetric tensor, right? but on the right hand side, what I see is a very simple expression for that tensor. And this particular representation is called the spectral decomposition, okay? having to do with the spectrum of uh, A. So quick question for you. Why did I put a sum sign explicitly? Because I have three indices. So not to violate the summation. Uh, rules. Okay, so let me show where. Okay, sort of a not really a proof, but sort of a uh, way to see that this holds. Okay, so a tensor a is tensor a times identity, still the tensor a. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in the expression for i. Now i, let us. So these are ortho orthogonal. And you remember that we typically normalize them. I don't have two, two, but usually one normalizes the eigenvectors as well. So let's say that they are orthonormal. So in that case, the identity would be simply vi bun vi. Do we agree? Earlier, I had expressed i to be delta ij, right? Identity matrix ei bun. Ej, this is any orthonormal basis, right? And substitution property gave me Ei bun Ei. And now I'm not choosing any E, but rather I'm choosing the eigenvectors of A as the basis, and hence the expression for I. So now I go ahead and operate on this. And now I'm using the expression that you have verified in the homework. I can move this inside as it is. So this is equal to, and that's homework, AVI bun VI. And AVI is nothing but the corresponding lambda times VI. Okay? But note that there's a sum over I. So when I make that transition, I is going to appear three times. And this is where I need to be careful and throw in a sum sign. Lambda I VI bun VI. And that's it. So that's sort of a simple way to get your spectral decomposition. Uh -huh. we, we utilize the fact that the basis vectors are normalized. Yeah. So does this constitute a problem for this? I just, I just said in words that pick also normalized. Right. So this just says that they're orthogonal, but we can always normalize them. Normalizing them does not change their properties at all because remember in the eigenvalue problem, the vector appears on the left and right hand side. So any vector multiple of V is also an eigenvector. Okay? So I just normalize them for convenience. Okay. 
But yes, it has to be. So in the expression, these have to be normalized. And that's why I picked it that way. OK. So let's continue with our series of definitions. And I'm going to erase this derivation here. Now, of course, the uh, symmetry of the tensor as soon as you write this is also apparent, right? Because remember, the transpose of this is you switch the basis. That's actually the definition of the transpose. Transpose of that is equal to sum of every tensor, lambda 1, v1, v1, 2, 2, 3, 3, right? And transpose of each one is, by definition, switch the two sides of the bond. And they are the same, and hence is symmetric, OK? But the fact that with respect to some bases, the tensor it let itself looks diagonal. In this case, with respect to this basis, the tensor looks like the matrix components lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, right? So that also implies symmetry. But it turns out we have to be careful. Remember at some point, actually, one of you guys asked, and I said, well, uh, sometimes what can happen is on the left and the right hand sides, there can appear uh, two different vectors, not the same one, but different ones. And in that case, still, it can look deceivingly, uh, or let's say deceptively, I, um, diagonal, but actually it's not symmetric. So, uh, so, so one has to always be careful with the bases, okay? The components themselves, if you look at them, you have to be careful when you're trying to deduce some properties of the tensor itself, like symmetry, okay? The tensor, like a vector, always you have to refer to the vector basis to understand what it really is, okay? And that's something I've tried to highlight again and again. So that, that remark I just made, um, um, I will give you an example when the appropriate time arrives. OK, so for now, uh, so I have a symmetric tensor. And let me just remind you what positive definite and positive semi-definite mean. So a. Symmetric tensor is positive definite if all of its eigenvalues, all of them, are greater than 0. It's semi-definite if some of them are perhaps all, but some of them are possibly 0. But none of them are negative. So you can switch the positive with the negative if you switch the sign. So you would read, for instance, this negative semi-definite if lambda i is less than or equal to 0. Okay. We are um, going to encounter tensors that fall into all of these categories, combinations of them. Um, so now, you might have encountered, and that's an entirely equivalent statement, an alternative a, a, a definition of what positive definiteness means. Um, so sometimes you see that asymmetric is positive definite. Now let me just abbreviate that like that, positive definite. If you calculate A dot tensor A, for an arbitrarily chosen vector a, and it always comes out to be greater than 0. This is perhaps, in fact, what you have seen in your uh, undergraduate linear algebra class. And It's equal to 0 if and only if the vector a is equal to 0. In fact, let's make that compact. So it's greater than or equal to 0 for every a. And it's 0 if and only if the vector itself is equal to 0. Uh, 
Uh, once you have, for instance, the spectral decomposition, again, some things you can verify yourself. If you like an expression like this, you can immediately verify yourself. That's a nice size, side exercise. exercise. So now let us assume that we do have a positive definite uh, tensor. So then, if you do, then you can take its square root. And actually, it's very simple. You just take the square root of the uh, components, the eigenvalues, and attach at them to the same basis, eigenvector basis, as A. Um, if it is. non-semi-definite, so I'm doing like a trick with words. All I'm saying is it, if it has no zero eigenvalue, if it has a zero eigenvalue determined to zero, I cannot invert it. So if it's not semi-definite, positive or negative semi-definite, then it has no zero eigenvalue, then I can calculate its inverse. And the inverse is likewise lambda i to the power minus 1 vi vi. And for that matter, actually, this is just a power 1 half any power of the tensor, you can just carry over to the eigenvalue and retain the eigenvector basis. Okay. okay, these are nice expressions that we are going to refer to in the future. Okay. And in terms of the eigenvalues, finally, what I can do is well, at this point, I don't have to have a symmetric tensor. But um, remember, we had the three invariants. The three invariants are defined for any tensor. Okay. okay. But let us do assume that we have uh, we have symmetry. It doesn't matter. Uh, so then, if you like to express the three invariants in terms of the eigenvalues, it's actually quite simple. And um, so. The way perhaps you can remember is that the invariant number has to do with the appearances of A. So if it appears only uh, once, the resulting expression is linear in A, twice quadratic, three times cubic. And that's why the determinant is cubic in terms of the components of A. So therefore, when I write the invariants, and since eigenvalues are the components with respect to the eigenvector basis, then the number of appearances of lambda that multiply each other has to do with the corresponding order of the invariant. So the first one has only one appearance. The second one has appearances of two, combinations of two. So lambda 1, lambda 2, quadratic in the components. Lambda 1, lambda 3, lambda 2, lambda 3. And the last one is going to be simply the And it's, of course, nothing fancy. Because if I write the matrix with respect to its eigenvector basis, this is how it looks. So the first invariant, remember, is just the trace. You sum them. The last one is the determinant, multiplication, and so on. Okay, And this is nothing but the cofactor or adjugate is symmetric in this case, the same, divided by the determinant. Okay, So it's uh, quite straightforward. Questions? Is it too early for too much tensor algebra? No, <laughs> no, it's not too early. Okay, okay so uh, I have just a few minutes. I think there's just enough time uh, so that I can define one more thing, right? Uh, and I'm going to define, I think, uh, the so-called axial vector. <laughs> 
So I talked about the general tensor, has nine independent components, some invariants, etc., associated with that. Then I went on to a symmetric one, six independent components. We discussed like the spectral decomposition and everything. So let us recall what a skew symmetric tensor was. It's a tensor such that the transpose is equal to minus itself. So, and I told you at the time that, well, we did recognize together that it must necessarily have only three independent components because the diagonal components with respect to any basis must vanish. And the off-diagonal ones are minus one another. Okay. Okay. So three independent vectors. So all this discussion naturally leads us to uh, a skew symmetric tensor. And now, since it has three independent components, I told you that it is like a vector in some sense. A, sense, a vector also has three independent components. So then one might ask him or herself, is it possible to associate with a skew symmetric tensor a vector? which also has three independent components. And that is the concept of an axial vector. So the definition comes as usual, right? A tensor is defined by the way it acts on a vector. So let me assume that I take some vector. In this case, it's not an eigenvector or anything. It's just any vector. And of course, this vector will change due to the operation of W on V. And you get a new vector, V prime. Um, now. The way I'm going to associate a vector with uh, this tensor W is by, again, trying to obtain the same vector V prime from the same input V in some fashion. So I want to obtain throwing V into some calculation and, again, obtain V prime. In this case, I have a tensor operating on a vector. Now I'd like to associate that tensor with a vector. So now I'd like to have some vector w here. Okay? That is not the tensor. It's just some vector associated with the tensor w. So this is going to be called the axial vector of the tensor, skew symmetric tensor w. And what I like is two vectors working on each other, and the only way that's possible is if I throw in a cross product, okay? That is the idea behind introducing a, ax, uh, a, a vector, a axial vector associated with the original skew symmetric tensor. They sort of, let me say, operate, this is not linear, but, uh, or is it? I guess it is. Uh, operates on the original vector V, and you get the same output V prime. So hence, the statement is that the axial vector is such that the operations give you the same result, in this case, V prime. Okay. V and V prime are different? V and V prime are necessarily different because this is a tensor operating on a vector gives you another vector. Okay? But you said uh, the definition of axial prime. Vector is such that this, this, and that give you the same vector, V prime. Okay? And hence the equality. All right. Um, now, how does this axial vector look in terms of the component of the tensor? Homework problem. You can work it out yourself based on this underlying definition. Uh, we can immediately, by the way, recognize something about the skew symmetric tensor since we talked about invariance and eigenvalues. Uh, if I look at the determinant of W, right? So determinant of W is equal to, W is equal to minus W transpose. Determinant is Q, right? Directly from here. Determinant of uh, a tensor is, or determinant is cubic in the components of the tensor, so this minus comes out as a minus, or minus one to the cube. And that's minus determinant of W transpose is equal to determinant itself, 
So determinant of W is minus determinant W, okay? Which means determinant of W is equal to zero. Now, the determinant of W equals 0, right? So determinant is sum of the, uh, multiplication of the three eigenvalues, right? So it doesn't mean that all the eigenvalues are 0. It means that there exists at least one, at least one eigenvalue that is equal to 0. Has at least one eigenvalue equals 0. Zero tensor is, by definition, also skew. Uh, and that's where at least comes into play. Okay? It could have all eigenvalues equals zero. But for a non-trivial skew symmetric tensor, it has at least one eigenvalue equals zero. OK. Questions? Homework to you Thursday, right? All right, I'll see you on Thursday then.